Hey, what's up again, guys? This is Ivan from GetIvan.com, and I'd like to welcome you to my Inkscape logo design tutorial. So, let me just one second, and we will get started. All right. So, you've decided that you want to make a logo for a new asset, a brand, um for your existing local business, whatever. So what makes a good logo and how do we do that in Inkscape? And those are kind of two different questions, but to simplify, over mm, something like 90, 90 something percent of the logos used by the biggest companies out there are comprised of text and usually a simple image, one or the other, but usually just text. If you ever do a search, let's see if we can pull up a search real quick. So this is a very popular and well-known uh, image. Give me just one second to recorrect my, whenever I pulled that up, messed up my camera. This is a very popular and well-known image. If you ever do a search on uh, logo colors, you'll find this this picture very uh, very commonly referred to. And you can see some people associate certain colors with certain expressions, right? So uh, yellow communicating a certain feeling, orange communicating a certain feeling, and so on and so forth. And if you take a look at some of these logos, you'll notice that they have a lot of things in common. Um, for one, they're usually one kind of font. Uh, many of them are only text. Um, many of them are a conjunction of text and a simple image, a simple icon, something very simple, right? And um, most of them are focusing on the use of one primary color and one or two neutral colors, black or white, or gray sometimes. Some of them incorporate multiple colors, like you'll see Subway here, for example, uses um, green and yellow. And then, of course, it uses the neutral color of white. Usually, don't count neutral colors when you're looking at color schemes. You can see Pennzoil uses yellow and red. Yellow and red, there are certain colors that go together. Yellow and red is a pretty common one. Um, blue and gold is pretty common. You can see uh, Shell uses yellow and red. McDonald's uses uh, yellow and red. Here you can only see it using yellow. But um, really useful to look at that from a bird's eye and understand that powerful logos are simple. They're very simple. And they're iconic. You know, if you take a look at this logo, the Target, you immediately know that's Target. Take a look at this logo down here. That's the Monster logo. Or this here, that's BP. There's John Deere. There's Apple. Um, what else? There's Firefox. That's a little bit more complex, but everybody knows that. Um, there's Shell, of course, as we already pointed out, Yahoo. So when you're making a logo, and this is just a quick overview of logo theory or whatever you want to call it, um, it's usually best to keep things simple. For some reason out there in the generic logo design market, uh, a lot of these cheaper logo makers have these large portfolios of these kind of complex and unusual attempting to be clever kinds of logo designs. But the truth is that you can make a logo using simple images and it doesn't have to be complicated, doesn't have to be fancy, and it doesn't really require any special skills. You can do it, you can do so using Inkscape. I am not a person that I would say is, uh, I'm not an artist, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not, um, someone who is able to do anything fancifully artistic using graphic design programs. I just had a need, a necessity, and I started looking into the topic and figuring out how do we do this really simply, cheaply, quickly, right? So let's go back to Inkscape. 
Okay, so looking back into Inkscape, where do we start? Well, let's start with a concept for a brand, okay? So when I'm doing something for an intermediary asset, for example, let's say I'm going to start making some Web 2.0 properties for a dental brand or um, or a nail salon or really whatever, local business or otherwise, it doesn't matter. Starting from there, I try to think about, you know, how do I, what's a, what's a simple name that I can, you know, come up with? And I usually, I usually go with, and I'll, I'll cover these kinds of things in another video, but I usually go with something simple like the combination of a color or an object, like, you know, lightning dental or star dental or, um, or pink dental or something really simple, right? And, and then I'll buy that domain name, pinkdental.com or whatever, or uh, big circle, you know, big circle nail salon.com or something like that, or dot click or dot us or whatever. And then I'll go and I'll make me a quick logo. And, you know, I'd say about half of them are kind of plain, and the other half actually turn out to be pretty awesome. And, but that's, you know, the point is that I have a method here that I can share with you using Inkscape that's really effective. So let's, um, let's say that our brand is going to be uh, Purple Pillow, for example. I would start with, uh, by deciding my document properties here. So I would go to File and click on Document Properties. I would go to units, I would set them to pixels. And I usually usually like to work within dimensions of around 525 or so. And uh, 525 by 525. And then you can close that. So once you once you enter those in and hit enter, you can close this area and it'll set that here. You can hold control and right click in order to drag the palette. You can also hold control and zoom in with the mouse wheel or by using the uh, the zoom magnifying tool here. You can also middle click the mouse wheel to center your palette however you like it to be. I like it to be in the center of my screen-ish. Um, and then I would take a square here. It's usually best to design things within a square because um, not everything um, snaps to a circle. Some things will snap to a circle even though you design in a square in terms of loading your your logo into various platforms. But it's always a good idea to design things in a square. And um, then in whatever platform you're looking at, it'll you can mess with how it appears, how it centers on that square. So I'm gonna hold control shift and then I'm gonna drag this square and then I'm gonna click this mouse to, so that I can control that square. I'm gonna bring it down here, and then I'm gonna make sure I, in uh, object, I'm gonna have the align and distribute section turned on. I'm gonna scroll, I'm gonna, let me click this arrow on text and font. I don't use that section that frequently. I just go up at the top bar. I'm gonna scroll down to align and distribute and click on that menu and it'll pop open. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna click my object and I'm going to align my object relative to the page. You can actually have it relative to certain things like a selection area or the last selected object. And that's very useful in certain situations. And um, we might get to that in the future with case studies. But we'll do, um, I'll go ahead and click center on horizontal axis and center on vertical axis. So that perfectly centered my object. And then I'm going to come in here while the object is selected. And you'll see that with the arrows around it when it's selected. And I'm going to click on width here. And I'm going to make sure that it's 525. Hit enter. Oh, that's millimeters. Okay, make sure that you're set to pixels. And let's try that again. 525, enter. And I'm going to hit tab. I can't hit tab here. 
I'm gonna click in the uh, horror, horizontal section. I'm gonna do Control A to select that whole section and do 525 and hit enter. And then I'm gonna re-center that. I guess you could have just centered it after. Um, if you can't see this object, you might have the color white selected. So whenever you make your object, you wanna make sure that it's some color. It doesn't matter what color it is. You can always change it later. Um, my color is even has some opacity to it right now. So let's go ahead and make sure that the color is fully 100% opacity. You can pop out that fill, fill and stroke section by coming to object and clicking fill and stroke, I believe. Um, you're going to be on, you can, you can select CMYK there if you want, if that's relevant, if you're in the print industry. Uh, RGB is fine though. A lot of uh, things are done that way. So, um, so now we've got our, our, uh, our canvas, if you will. There's a, when you select an object, there's a, there's a quick section here at the top that allows you to kind of rotate and whatnot. I usually like to have my, my background image uh, at the very bottom of the layer. Um, you can kind of think of layers as sheets of paper. You know, you might have the, the, the white sheet of paper at the back, and then you might have an object you're dealing with on top of that so that it's visible. If, you, if that object, like a circle, for example, let's use an example, let's create a circle, and we'll, we will color this circle yellow. If, this circle right now is on top of that square, but if we click uh, if we click this button here to lower the selection one step down, it'll actually go behind the square. And if we click the square and have it lowered to the, the very bottom layer, then of course the yellow circle comes back to the top. And you can click on the layer section here and you can, you can actually create different layers. Right now we're modifying the objects within a particular layer. Sometimes it's necessary to create multiple layers and then you can mask certain layers by clicking this eyeball. You can make them visible and invisible, lock them, etc. And that way you can deal with things on one layer and not modify another layer. In most cases, my designs are simple enough that I just, I don't even bother. I just leave them on one layer. If I make, if I accidentally put something behind and I can't get a hold of it, then I might move an object and then, then I'll be able to get hold of it. And then I can basically come and, and recenter it. So pretty simple system. But um, let's say, for example, I was going to do, what did we say? Purple pillow. Then I might come into this color palette here. And you, you can also go online and look in different, different mm, variations of purple. And you can use the color hex system. They usually have a hex number when you're looking for colors and you can actually input that hex into the RGBA section here uh, before this double uh, double F here at the end of the string. You can uh, you can insert a hex uh, number or a hex uh, value there. It's, I believe it's six characters. And so you can you can take a color from the Internet and you can paste it in there. And um, the program will know what it is. Pretty useful uh, when you're looking to use color palettes from the internet, or maybe you like a color from another brand or something like that. Then you can you can grab its hex using a browser tool, for example, and come in here and, and pop it in there. So, um, <clears throat> and that's useful for things where maybe. For example, if you have an Amazon affiliate site and you want it to have the, the scheme, the color scheme match the Amazon scheme, the color scheme, then you could kind of be sneaky and do something like that. Um, so let's let's just select that color, a purple color here that seems pleasing. Uh, there's no really rule to it. It's just what you think looks good for what you're trying to do. There, there's there's definitely value in spending some time here, but uh, I'm not going to, I like softer colors. You know, if you use the harder, the color, it's, it's definitely more intense. Uh, so I usually like to use softer hues of whatever color I'm looking at. For example, I wouldn't necessarily use uh, dark red. I might use a, see a more subtle 
a variation of that red. Not maybe not that low, but maybe something like that. Not quite that rich, and maybe maybe darker. But you can also come up here to um, the opacity section, uh, and you can kind of uh, modify it a little bit. You got to be careful though, because the background, uh, whatever the background that you're putting it on is, will will also contribute to the to the characteristic of that color. Um, and you can also come in here to these variables here and you can kind of lower and raise the darkness and, and, and get pretty specific. I usually like to stick with the palette because it um, it's good enough. There's plenty of variations in there and, and, and you can kind of get a little obsessive. So, all right, so let's just go ahead and pick that color purple. I think that's nice. And um, then I just take my text here and drop it down. You don't have to do control shift, but you can because you can modify it layer later. And then you can come in here and you can select your text. So let's go to the browser real, real quick and I'll show you uh, some important things to know about selecting your text. So here is a site called Font Squirrel. It's pretty popular and well known. And you can come to a site like this and you can download free, commercial free fonts, and install them on your computer and then you'll have the ability to use them in Inkscape and other um, document type program, doc programs. So basically all you have to do is, is find some, some fonts you like. I usually open them in different tabs and then I look at them and download them at some point. Say Milkshake for example. And before you download something, you always want to take a quick look at the license and just make sure that it's some variation of commercial free. Um, sometimes you'll have specific licenses. In those cases, you might want to spend a little bit more time before you download them and use them. I believe that Font Squirrel is all 100% commercial free for use licenses, but, but you might want to check just in case just so that you don't have to deal with hassle later. Um, there are other sites as well, like 1001 Fonts. Let's go to that one real quick. This is another popular solution. And um, you can sort by popularity. Let's see if we can... Let's sort by popularity. Here's a Walt Disney looking one. And uh, you see this one's only free for personal use. So I would go back, for example, and, and make sure that um, I've got free for commercial use checked here in the options. And, uh, and, then, go, and then go through and maybe mess with some of these, these things here. Um, I'll go ahead and select this Godfather. And you can see some of those options here. I'll go ahead and select this Godfather font. Take a look. This one's free for commercial use. You can also type in your text to see what it looks like. Um, and then, of course, you can just download it. And once you download it, that file, that TTF file or that OTF file or whatever it's called, you can right click and install it. Or you can actually drag a whole file and, and drop them into your uh your font section i'm not sure how it works on mac but on computer you can you can go to your font section and control panel and you can drag things in there and install them within a matter of seconds um, another site that's useful <coughs> is the font font.com this one i believe has even more fonts than either font scroll or a thousand and one fonts but uh you, there, it's much more broad, so you have to make sure that you filter for the ones that um, are commercial free. Anyways, once you get those installed, you can go back to Inkscape. And um, so when you make your, your font selection, you can come in here into this list and find a font. It's usually a good idea to use something mainstream, well-known. Um, you can go to Font Squirrel or 1001 Fonts or whatever and look at the popular themes 
and you can do a Google search. Also, before I forget, another good place is font.google.com, fonts.google.com. And these are open, I believe that these are open source fonts directly provided by Google, which is extremely useful. Um, I believe that they're open source. Pretty sure that they're all that way. So you might want to check that one out. Um, I usually go to some of the other providers, but this is a good, this is a really strong, simple places to go to as well. Let's see what's featured here. Plex, Super Families, Life Fresh. The ones that I'm aware of are things like this, Open Sands, Lato Roboto, Montserrat's well-known, Oswald is very popular in marketing community communities. Uh, Railway is one of the major fonts that Google uses in different places. Um, I think that's the default font in Google Docs, or it might, maybe not. I, or for for the slides for the headers it is and it's kind of specific but um anyways there's a lot of useful things the ubuntu font there so a lot of great, great places to find commercial free or open source fonts anyways find something well known common here's lobster for example very well known and so we'll do something like uh usually you want to do something really simple like initials or just the text and you'll notice in the in major brands they're usually one single word or one single sort of acronym um or symbol so it's it's not very common to see two words or three words etc. And so even with a brand like Purple Pillow, for example, um, I might do some initials. So I might do PP. And that might be it. That might be all I want to do. Just to give you an example of solid logo design. So let's find, I was going to use uh, lobster, really common. And, and I might not even do two P's. I might just do one P, just an expressive P, right? And I might not want to do uh, that kind of hard black. I might want to do a softer black, like 80% or 70% black. So let's try 70% there. That's always a little too soft. Let's try 80%, bam. Perfect. You see the difference? 80% versus 100. And to me, this is about as complicated as it is as you need to get. You know, is it perfect? Is it the most, you know, Taco Bell, McDonald's looking logo? No, but it's simple and it's free. It's easy to do. Anybody can do this. And that's the whole point of this tutorial is, is something that anybody can do. So a really simple P there that, to represent your brand. So another, another way you could go about it is, um, obviously, I think this is the one of the strongest ways, just a really simple letter. And, and you can spend some time, you know, going through and finding a font that is really expressive to your brand. I did, um, I had a sort of uh, freestyle sport kind of asset that um, I was working at at one point that is kind of in stasis right now. It's kind of in, well, in, not in stasis, it's kind of in flux. But uh, I, I chose this one, Sedgwick Avenue Display. And um, I think I just did, for that brand, I think I just did the letter S. So you can see that for something like that, it could be really effective. And I would make this smaller. And I would actually, if you hold shift, or maybe not shift, hold, hold control and click, you notice that the arrows shift from going out and in to going around. And so if you click, if you click, hold control and you click that so that they're going around, and then you hold control and shift, you can actually have it shift at, you see, increments. So 
I, this would be normal. This would be more of an attitude. So I would have it something like um, not quite there, but maybe there. And then I would recenter that and bam, it's an S with an attitude, you know, and I might even make this a little softer in this case, since this font is, mm, no, that's a little bit too soft. I'll just make it a little smaller since that font's so much thicker than some of the other ones that we were using. And maybe that's a little too small, maybe a little bit bigger. But then there, that's it. And then let me zoom out a little bit. That's a logo. It, is it the, the greatest thing in the world? Is it the next Instagram? No. <laughs> but it's but it's fine. You know, it's fine for an intermediary asset, a brand, uh, a small business. It's a, it's, a, it's a good starting place. And that's the whole point of learning how to do logo design in Inkscape is you can you can do really simple things like this and you don't have to be an expert. Um, so let's go back to a purple pillow and let's see if there's anything else that we can we can achieve. Let's try let's try um, purple pillow. I don't want to do it like that, of course. That's way too big, and that font is pretty obnoxious. Let's try Lobster 1.3. And we definitely need to lower this uh, size here. It's way too large. You might consider doing it one on top of the other. It's a little tougher to do. In that case, you're going to want to... Uh, do shift enter and then select all and let's see here you're going to want to use this feature here you see the a on top of the a to change the spacing between baselines so let's try putting it at 2.25 and that's too much so we need to lower it to 0.25 see if that works Sometimes this feature does not work very well. Maybe it's maybe it's just that I don't know how to use it properly. But this is I've been able to get it to work sometimes. And and sometimes you might have a hard hard time getting those kinds of things to work. And if that's the case, it's really a lot easier to just do two text boxes in that case. So you might want to do something like purple and have it, you know, maybe manually move it up here. And then you, what you can do is you can do, you can select a, a, an object like a text box or, an, or, a, or, an, or a, a square or a circle or whatever, and you can do control D and that'll duplicate it. And then you can drag it wherever you want it to be in relation to the other thing. Like maybe you want to line that P line directly with the P line below that you know, to give a nice sort of graphical appearance. So then you can do something like that. Obviously, you wouldn't do purple, purple. So let's do pillow in there. And let's see um, if there's any way we can, we can line this up to look good. Maybe the L with the R there or the P line so that they're diagonally, diagonally uh, lined up there and they look... Uh, um, more expressive that way. Purple pillow, I think that looks interesting. Let's see, they're definitely off out of sync there, but but they but it looks more expressive that way. So I would also basically take these two objects and combine them into one object. So I would click one object and I click the I would I would hold shift and click the other and then I would right click here and click group and that groups them into one object and then I can center them together and expand them simultaneously so we've got purple pillow um, all together like that now there's something about doing more than one word where for some reason it just does not look good you know and that's when it comes that's where it comes into we come into the realm of reverse engineering you know looking at you know other brands that do multiple words 
And what I found is that they mostly, they mostly um, will color us the second word or the first word differently in a different neutral color or maybe in an outline um, in, in, in such a way where it, it, it creates a different dynamic. It's very uncommon to see two words of the same color. Not to say that you won't find that, just, just a point of just talking about design theory or whatever you want to call it. So for this second word, it might be better to do uh, a really light, uh, a, a, a milkier white, like a 2.5% gray, something like this, or maybe a, you might do a pure white, 2.5% gray, or maybe a 5% gray, maybe 2.5%. So that might be better that way, or you might you might want to just say, "Hey, we need to um, uh, make purple, purple, right?" And so this is a kit situation where you would want to uh, copy this purple color to uh, that color, so you could um, select the word purple, and then you could select this teardrop uh, tool, and then select the color purple that you want, and then you could select the background here, and you could make this background. Uh, that milky white and you could come in here and and um, change the the number of the color of pillow again so we might want to make this a 70 percent gray for example or you might even want to just do it another variation of purple so um, I think this was the color that we used so you might want to do a lighter uh, uh, variation on the same uh, palette right or maybe a darker variation, just a slightly darker variation. And, and you might even want to reverse that. So you could click on purple and then do the teardrop to that color and then come back to this color and, <laughs> and, then, and make it a lighter uh, variation of the same purple. So purple pillow, really simple. And that's actually kind of pretty there, isn't it? And that kind of looks pink though, doesn't it? So you might, you know, this is the process, you know, you go into logo design and you end up jumping through a hundred hoops and realizing, okay, maybe we want to do things a little differently and make it this variation of purple and come in here and make it this variation of purple. So just depends on your brand, depends on the asset you're making. But as you could see, you know, I was able to do that within five minutes or 10 minutes or 50, however long it's been really quick, really simple. And you can make something that looks nice and professional. There's lots of ways to do it. You know, if you, um, um, if you have any questions, just contact me, let me know. I think that's pretty much it. Um, this is the majority of what I do in logo design. I just, I do an icon, an image, um, uh, not an image, what am I saying? I do an icon, a, um, a, a single letter, or maybe a single word, ideally, or maybe a couple words with different uh, characteristics in terms of... Um, in terms of how they're differentiated like that. And uh, there's there's some more advanced topics, some more specific things that we can go into in the future in terms of aligning things, in terms of um, creating uh, depth to certain words. And uh, we'll get into those in the future, but that's the basic idea of how I do logo design and Inkscape and how I think it's simple enough or pretty much anybody can do this. So I appreciate your time. Thank you guys for watching. Make sure to contact me if you have any questions or suggestions, and I will catch you later. Thanks. Bye-bye.